watch these videos and I was like, whoa, you can actually take your knowledge and expertise and your unique background and just articulate it and package it into a product, a speaking engagement, an ebook or an online course and build a business around this, just teaching people what you know. And that was the first time I really paid attention to what that meant and what that looked like. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla matthews Okome. So let's get started. Today's episode is brought to you by Gusto. Gusto offers modern, easy payroll benefits and HR to small businesses across the country. They were even named Best Online Payroll by PC Matt. And as a Side Hustle Pro listener, you will get three months free when you run your first payroll. So sign up and give it a try at gusto.com slash SHP. That's gusto.com slash SHP. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today in the guest chair, I have a real treat. It's not often that I get to talk about my guests from a personal lens, having experienced their product or their business in a real way. And so I love when I get to do that. And today in the guest chair, I am introducing you to my own best kept secret, the woman who has taught me to turn my knowledge into a valuable and premium course. Her name is Danielle Leslie, and she founded Culture Ad Labs to help companies and individuals uncover their culture ad and launch profitable products online. She is also the creator of Course From Scratch, an eight-week online intensive that helps people create and launch their profitable and pop-in online courses. And that's the program I did. She has been an online marketer in Silicon Valley for almost 10 years and helped personal brands and influencers, including Guy Kawasaki, earn collectively millions of dollars by launching their online courses. One of the reasons I wanted to have Danielle on the show is because her framework for course launches addresses our common human tendency to get stuck on all of the preparation and planning and delay launching our courses. Danielle says she would see it over and over again. Brilliant people who think they have to have 25 modules of content pre-recorded, a million worksheets and downloads, and months and months of work before releasing their knowledge into the world. So she teaches people like myself to not fall into the trap of creating your course content all before you're ready to launch and instead focus on what she calls the four C's. She is going to break that down on this episode. And by the way, you can hear all about this process in her masterclass, which you can sign up for at sidehustlepro.co slash course from scratch. So you can go to the masterclass and learn all about the program if you're interested. In my own case, I have wanted to launch a podcast training program for almost a year. And I've just been dragging my feet because, number one, I was overwhelmed with the thought of breaking all of the content down, everything I've been doing for almost two years down into a program. And two, I knew it was really valuable information that I'd have to charge a premium price point for. And I, just being honest, I was scared to set that premium price point. So I turned to Danielle and with her guidance, I launched my podcast accelerator as an invite only program in February And it's been an amazing experience so far. What I've learned from Danielle and what you'll learn on this show is that focusing on creating a course that truly meets your students' needs means creating it with their active feedback, not just creating it all at once without their input and just dumping it out there and hoping it's helpful. I've also learned that it's not going to be perfect the first time you do it. So you have to get down to it and just start so you can improve it with your students' help. In this episode, we'll get really tactical. So you will see how you can do this, how you can get over your fear of charging what your course or program is worth. Danielle will break down her straight line to the cash formula that shatters the most popular course creation narrative. She'll also talk about the tools she used to do a 20,000 course launch in just 60 days with no email list. She'll also talk about her MVC method to not overthink your launch and to pre-sell your course. And finally, We'll talk about how her online course made $25,000 alone in one month on Instagram and how it has exploded since then. As a matter of fact, as this episode premieres, Danielle just crossed the $100,000 mark in one month, her first six-figure month. 
And in today's episode, she breaks down how she's quickly approaching the one million in revenue this year. She's breaking down the numbers, y'all real numbers. <laughs> Again, if you want to learn how Danielle's online course made 25000 in one month alone, you can go to her Course from Scratch Masterclass at sidehustlepro.co slash course from scratch. And now let's get into it. So welcome to the guest chair, Danielle. Thank you so much for having me, Nikayla. Super excited to be here. Me too. I'm excited for you to be here. I am literally just jumping out of my chair to do this interview today because I'm just ready for you to share all of the nuggets with my audience. But first and foremost, tell us a little bit about your background. You know, what did you want to be when you were younger? Yeah. Um, so for most of my life, according to my mom from like two and a half, I wanted to be an obstetrician, as I would say. Um, and I'd be like, I want to be an obstetrician because uh, I saw it in a book one time and I just latched onto it. So up until I was 17 years old, I was convinced I was going to be an OB. Um, so yeah, in high school, I was in the health careers academy, worked in the hospitals, did the whole thing. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to be for like most of the first part of my life. Did you go to college for that? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> luckily, when <laughs> luckily when I went to like the little overnight stay program right before going into college, um, they you know they give you the little booklet about what you want to study. And by that time, I realized you know I'm not really feeling science and math like that. And I'm pretty sure if I go into the medical field, I'm gonna need to be into those things. And so what I did is I just took a step back and I realized you know I really love um, the English language. So I love. Uh, reading, but more so like ex expressing myself, communicating, uh, manipulating language. And so that's when I discovered, you know, philosophy and rhetoric more specifically. So I went to Berkeley, which is one of the like few places I think that offers rhetoric as a major. And yeah, so I, I ended up studying that. And that's where I really got to study the English language and how we use language to communicate our values, but also to influence others. How interesting. I didn't know that. Like the more you know. <laughs> so so yeah. at, at what point did you start to think more entrepreneurially? And like, do you think your upbringing influenced that at all? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because one thing I was really blessed to have was my my mom and my dad, like, they let me do me. So ever since just out the womb, my mom was usually just like paying attention to what my strengths were and just giving me the biggest stage to showcase them. And she didn't care what they were. Um, even to this day, me and my sister, it's like my sister's an amazing dancer or performer. So my mom will, you know, encourage her to do that um, and not push us into whatever society says we should do or whatever. So I think that really helped me be able to pave my own path. Um, and my uh, my dad is definitely a tinkerer. Um, and so I have I grew up with my stepdad. And then so my other dad, um, he's a tinkerer. And so he is very entrepreneurial. He's always had his full time job, very successful IT role, but also had businesses. Um, so I think I was kind of influenced, um, you know, by those things. And it's crazy to think about it. But I feel like the first marketing campaign I ran was, you know, in like middle school when I ran for uh, the Ritz Queen or whatever, the <laughs> dance that we had, you know, um, and I remember making the posters and like, you know, and that was like the first marketing campaign I ran. Uh, and I continue to run those, you know, for ASB president and like prom queen in high school. Um, so I guess I, I had always just exhibited this, this, uh, this drive for like leadership and to be in a role where I could create my own path. Like we gonna make, we gonna do a new kind of assembly. Like what we gonna do this at lunch. We're gonna do something new. Um, so yeah. So now what was your initial path after undergrad? Um, so I really got bit by the whole startup Silicon Valley bug, you know, just being at Cal, you're, you're surrounded by all the, the messages about, you know, this, like, this dream of, I remember I was taking a web development class and, um, and I didn't do well in it, by the way, but I took the class and I was <laughs> learning, you know, this was like, oh my God, what, 2006 or something. Um, and just learning about how to build websites. Uh, and we had Tim Westrogen, the founder of Pandora come and speak to our class. And this is when Pandora, you know, was still kind of growing and everything and hearing him speak and just talk about the fundraising process and all that. Um, it, it just, fell into this whole like glamorization of what it meant to be like 
a, fa- a founder, like a startup founder. And, and so that became my dream. You know, it was, it was that, and it was also a, some, my first internship was an SEO internship. So I was doing search engine optimization uh, for like Adobe and other clients at this firm. And that summer, I not only got exposed to, you know, working in SEO, but also um, I read the four hour work week and never eat alone. And so that summer just completely changed my outlook and the trajectory of my life. After reading that book, I was like, okay, I want to be a startup founder. We're going to create this company and we're going to, you know, grow it and sell it for, you know, back then millions of dollars was a lot of money <laughs> today. Not really, but back then I was like, we're going to sell it for like two to $3 million <laughs> after two years. And that's going to be the story. And then I'm going to have all this cash and then decide what I want to do next. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the, that was the inception of like the next dream. Uh, well, yeah. What was that? How long did it take to do your first startup? Yeah. So it didn't take too long. My first job out of college, I was in a sales role at a gaming company. So it's like a gaming startup. And it was back when Facebook, I don't know if you remember, it was like when we had on the Facebook wall, you couldn't even post like multimedia. You couldn't post photos or videos. This was like way back in the day. And so there was an app called Superwall. And so this app allowed you to post multimedia on your friends' walls. So I worked for the company that created Superwall. It was my job to like sell, you know, app space and ad space and stuff to advertisers. I was there for only about two years. And during maybe, you know, a year and a half in, a really good friend of mine, Ariel, Ari Fitz is what she goes by today. She also went to Cal with me and she had started doing these meetups at a Berkeley cafe. And they were all around bringing millennials together to decide, okay, how are we going to grow our personal brands? How are we going to make our mark online? So I would meet with her and her crew, you know, every Sunday, we'd meet up at a cafe and just talk about how we were building ourselves online. And she decided to turn that. She's like, what if we go on tour. Like why are rappers and rock stars the only ones out here that could do tours? Um, <laughs> and today everybody's touring, right? Like that's totally a thing today. But back then, like we were not touring like that. Like that was not a thing. And so she's like, we're doing a tour. And so we start like looking for sponsors and I'm kind of helping out on the side. And it comes to a point where she's like, all right, Danielle, I need somebody to be all in on this. Like you need to take the summer off. We're going to be touring, but we're also taking this all the way. So either you're in or not. And um, yeah, and I was like, I am absolutely in. I don't think it wait, took wait, me very wait. long to decide. Touring, <laughs> what, what, what were y'all doing? What, what, what kind of knowledge were you sharing on this tour? <laughs> I know it was really funny. So the thinking behind it. So, you know, when you're starting a company, like we knew our audience and the problem we wanted to solve, right? So we knew we want to help millennials start and grow their online businesses and grow their personal brands. So like that was a problem we wanted to solve. And so Ari's thinking was, well, we need to learn more about this target demographic, learn more about their pain points and learn more about what solutions we can create for them. So she thought, you know, Steve Blank says, get out of the building. And so she's like, well, let's get out the building. Let's just get out the state too. And so this tour was supposed to be like customer research tour. And so what we did is we held meetups in 13 different US cities and they would be meetups for young entrepreneurs. And we were like, we're coming. And in certain states, we brought in speakers. So we would bring like established entrepreneurs to talk to them, to talk to them. Um, and that was it. And what we did is we raised money. So like my job, I was a money person. So my job was to raise the sponsorship. So we raised almost 10 K to fund this thing. And we used crowdfunding. So back then crowdfunding was not a thing, but we used um, Indiegogo to like raise money and we got brand sponsors on board. And then we also got a partnership with Justin TV, which was totally a thing back then. And so they were, you know, live <laughs> broadcasting people. So we would live broadcast our meetup events and, wow. you know, have like tens of thousands of people watching and stuff all over. And, you know, the way we promoted it was like, we just created Eventbrite events. We did a Twitter campaign. So we did like a Rep Your City Twitter campaign and reached out to certain influencers and like tagged them and had them tag people in their cities. We did the same thing on Facebook. We just created a Facebook photo album and had, we tagged influencers in different cities and had them tag their friends. So this was all grassroots, you know, doing our thing. We talked to over 300 entrepreneurs in person and then we reached like, you know, 60,000 or something online. Um, And it was like a 40 day tour. So we were on the road for 40 days. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And what did you do with that research? Did you use it to then form some kind of solution? Yeah, great question. So yes, so what we ended up doing, and actually this is something I've learned, um, a lot of people, we get so caught up in tech and we think that when we are solving a problem, we need to create 
tech. Like we need to create some kind of technology to solve it. And the one thing I learned, I went to um, Startup Weekend and that's actually where we met our other co-founder, Virgilia, who is amazing, Virgilia Singh. And what I learned at Startup Weekend was the first thing you do is solve the problem without technology. So how would somebody in the year 1920 solve this same problem? Start there, solve it that way first. And then you can figure out how to then scale that or you know automate it or whatever. So what we learned by going on that tour is, okay, we can solve this problem through these in-person meetups. Now, how do we scale this? And so what we ended up doing is we took our list that we gathered from that tour and we uh, turned it into our database for this blog. So, you know, the vision was just, it was kind of like a tech crunch before young entrepreneurs, basically. So it was called Gen Juice, um, like Generation Juice, Gen Juice. And yeah, and so we launched with 65 content contributors. Um, so these were all people we met on the tour or whatever. Um, and yeah, so it was essentially a blog, to be honest with you. It was just a blog and events company, a content and events company. Um, that was the first kind of iteration. And we launched, and I think, you know, within the first couple of months, we got up to 10,000 monthly uniques, um, which again, back then was a big deal. <laughs> Today, not so much. Um, and yeah, and then through that, that was kind of, you know, our MVP, I would say the minimum viable product was the tour. And then the next version was the blog. And then we applied for um, accelerator programs, trying to get funding. Um, yeah. And so we actually got accepted into an accelerator program okay. um, in New York. Yeah. So nowadays you're very vocal about monetizing on day one, right? Walk us through, like, what did you learn from the accelerator and what happened next? Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I mean, it was completely backwards thinking to what I yeah think today um, because we were caught up in, well, we had a, we really just had a content and events company. We had a blog. We easily could have monetized it from day one, right? We could have easily created an ebook or some kind of information product to teach these people how to start their businesses. Like we could have brought in those experts, created products around them, but we were chasing the, you know, that, that dream that we created of we're going to found this thing. We're going to raise a bunch of money and uh, scale and then sell it. So in the accelerator program, I mean, we got a lot of input that nudged us that way, you know, into thinking, how can you develop some like crazy technology that's never been seen by humankind before that's going to you know revolutionize and we could get patents for it and all this stuff. We were definitely pushed in that direction as opposed to, okay, how about we get some paying customers, you know, come up with an offer that they want to pay for and then scale that. And turns out, you know, after that summer in the accelerator, we ended up pivoting every two weeks. We were building a new site, uh, coming up with a new solution. So by the end of the three months, we had no revenue, no customers and really no hope. It was like, oh, it was done. So, yeah. Oh, man. So when did you realize that this business was not going to work? And what did you do next? Like, OK, I got to get a job. Yeah. I mean, it was after that summer. It's like, I remember, oh, gosh, I remember this conversation. I was with Ari, you know, in this like high rise um, where we were crashing with someone or she, I think she was crashing with someone and I was crashing with somebody different. And we're in this place. And I remember this having this conversation with her and I had thought about it, you know, for, for the last couple of weeks. And I told her like, I'm not going to move forward with this. Um, I said, you guys can, but like, I'm not. And I just told her, you know, I realized this, I'm not about this life. Like I don't want to be working 16 hour days. Like I thought I wanted this life, this whole startup founder grind work 18 hours a day, but I don't, I actually like, balance. <laughs> like I want to be able to work, you know, like four hour work week. How the heck did I twist that, that four hour work week value into meaning work at 16 hour days? I have no idea, but I was like, I need to get back to, you know, yes, like building something. Um, and another thing that I realized that was important to me is I think I didn't know it at the time, but. But today I know that I just operate a lot better as a soul, as a solo founder. And so I knew that I wanted to do my own thing. Um, yeah. So I just had that conversation with her and my options were really to move back in with my mom. Like I had no, you know, I had left my job, like we had tried this thing. So luckily my mom, um, she was living in an apartment in Redondo beach and, you know, she's like, yep, you can come, you know, move on in with me. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. So that's when I moved in with my mom and kind of like started the, the next chapter. The next chapter. <laughs> so let's talk about that next chapter. Let's talk about your transition to Udemy. Did that happen right away? And why did you want to work there specifically? Yeah. So it took me about a year to realize that I needed to get a job. So I actually tried to do my own thing. I did freelancing. You know, so there was a time I was making like $250 a month from doing social media management, like, you know, just all these things. And um, during that year, though, 
a friend of mine, Monique Johnson, sent me a video of Brenda Burchard um, and then of Marie Forleo. And I watched these videos and I was like, whoa, you can actually take your knowledge and expertise and your unique background and just articulate it and package it into a product, a speaking engagement, an ebook or an online course and build a business around this, just teaching people what you know. And that was the first time I'd really paid attention to what that meant and what that looked like. So I did spend that year researching. I tried, I launched my first course. It was a complete flop, um, but I, you know, I learned from all the experts, thought I was doing all the right things. Um, and so after that, after that flop, I knew that listen, you've been struggling for a good year. You know, I hit an earning ceiling. I remember at the time I was, I was the most I had made was like $3,000 in a month. And I was like, okay, I'm going to need more than this if I want this to be my thing. So I said, well, I can go just learn from the people who are like the haven for online courses. So that's how Udemy came up for me. Um, I made my wish list. And this is how, like, I don't apply for roles that already exist. I create new roles. So I made my wish list and I said, you know, Udemy was on there, Skillshare was on there, and AppSumo was on there. They were the leaders to me in my mind at that time in the market. So I reached out to all three of them. And yeah, Udemy, I just wrote the VP uh, Dinesh, the VP of marketing, a cold email and messaged him on Facebook because we were in a Facebook group together. And yeah, and I just said, looks like you guys are facing these challenges. Here's what, I, how, here's how I think I could solve them. What do you think? Um, yeah. And then he's like, let's chat. And so, yeah, within a few weeks, um, I had the full-time role at Udemy and it was like my dream role. Can we just talk about how you just said, I don't apply for roles. I make roles. <laughs> <laughs> that is you know so what boss. Saying? Like, that's what we got to do. Yeah. That's what we have to do. I am big on being a life architect and creating the life you want. So I love that. So was your role there similar to what you are currently doing with coaching people to launch their own courses or how did that work? Yes. Um, so it was great because I apply, you know, when, when I first reached out, they had kind of a, a, a role they were looking for to fill. And as we went through the interview process, I got to kind of shape the role to be more, you know, to fit my strengths. And so, yeah, so for almost three years, I was at Udemy um, working with experts who came and they needed help launching their courses. And so I would get on the phone with them, um, dozens of, of people a week, and I would ask about their perfect customers, what their pain points are, and where we can find these people. And I would help them put together a launch strategy. So it was so great because, you know, one of the big learnings was like, we got a kid's yoga, like I worked with a kid's yoga teacher who had no email list. She had a YouTube channel and then she had, you know, Facebook page, um, but no email list. And this was her first digital product. Um, and she was able to do $10,000 in her first month, in her first 30 days of launching her course, just from using, you know, these launch strategies that I learned just from uh, launch by Jeff Walker, right? By reading that book, by following all of these people online and reverse engineering their funnels and figuring out what worked for them. And so we put together a strategy for her. And so I got to see her do that. I got to see a singer um, who now recently did $140,000 for her launch and is making multiple six figures. I got to see that like, you don't have to have a course on a business or making money online or tech to do well and to build a huge business. Um, that was like probably one of the biggest takeaways at Udemy, uh, which was amazing. I've heard you say that the universe pushed you into your next phase from you to me. So you were happy there, you were thriving, but how did you go from there to your next successful this time transition to entrepreneurship? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I was so happy at Udemy. Like it will always be the best place um, I've ever worked. Um, amazing team. And so because of the courses I was creating there, um, I was kind of uh, noticed by um, the founder of Maven. So I then went to another startup um, and Deshaun is a founder. He's like brilliant, amazing. Um, and so he had been, you know, he had been kind of actually inviting me to join the team for like three years. Like once a year, he would check in with me and be like, how about now? How about now? And so this <laughs> third time, um, I just looked at it and it was like, you know, they were helping over, they had a community of over 40,000 black women hairstylists. They had mostly black uh, employees. Like it was just crazy. I was like, this is amazing. I want to be a part of this. So I did join, um, did join that startup for, for about seven months and I did similar things. I just created courses for their stylists to help them, you know, um, 
grow their businesses online. But yeah, after about seven months, um, they let go about 30% of the company. And I was a part of that. So yeah, I was uh, completely just blindsided. It was super unexpected. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I was, uh, uh, man, I remember like walking from the office to BART. Luckily, um, Caleb, uh, my fiance now boyfriend at the time, worked like a few blocks away. So he met up with me and like walked me, did the, did the whole walk. Um, and I, I I didn't know what I was going to do. I actually thought I was going to find a new job, like a director of marketing role somewhere. Um, but what happened is that weekend, I went to a friend's, you know, Friendsgiving. Um, shout out to Craig. He's an amazing entrepreneur um, in Silicon Valley, has a lot of experience. And he had just sold his last company. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you're available? Um I'm, I'm about to hire you. And so like <laughs> that weekend, I mean, he's like, let's talk on Tuesday. I have a role for you. I want you to lead this small business initiative at my, at my company. So talk to him, you know, talk to, um, to Zim over at Chavon Noir. Like, she's like, wait, you're available. Uh, let's talk about hiring you. Uh, my best friend, Crystal, um, at Chris did it same thing. And so I just had all these people in my network, who I guess, you know, I've been given a lot of like unsolicited, I love giving unsolicited advice people. So I've been giving them a lot of this unsolicited <laughs> advice over the years. Apparently, you know, it worked a little bit and they were like, okay. So yeah. So I was kind of pushed into it. So yeah, within that first 30 okay. days of being um, laid off, I made over $10,000 and I booked over $35,000, which was the important part. Cause I was like, we need to make sure this is sustainable. So at least I right. knew I had some revenue coming down the pipe. Yeah. So that was kind of my foray. You know, it was okay. The courses really gave me like the people were like, oh, she's an expert. You know her stuff. Well, let me hire her to do this consulting. Now, you know, one thing I really like about you is your catchphrase, you know, um, drawing a straight line to the cash. And I think a lot of us get caught up in the act of doing it. So we feel like we're doing it and we're, and we're just doing busy work, right? To feel like we're getting closer and we're delaying secure in the bag. I don't know why, like if that is the goal, why we delay it? But it just, it scares us. So it makes us just kind of like do other stuff to distract ourselves. But you are big on like, no, what is the shortest avenue to the money? And it's not that you're teaching some kind of like, um, you know, crazy stuff or illegal or, <laughs> or unethical. Like you are just inspiring people to get down to business. So let's, let's get down to business. Let's talk about this process that you now teach. So when did you um, go from your client work to starting to say, okay, I'm going to launch my own online programming? Yeah. So it took me about six months. So six months after consulting and I was like, all right, we got to do this. And I was actually forced into it. I was, I was trying to put it off. I was not drawing a straight line because I was scared, um, you know, for this course launch. And so I ended up speaking at, um, empower her, which is now called summit 21 for 2190. Um, and yeah. And so after speaking, you know, Morgan was like, these women want to hear more from you. Like, can you do a webinar or something? So that forced me to launch before I was ready. So I didn't even have any course content. I had zero course content. All I did is I created a webinar and um, I taught these women, you know, how to get paid uh, for your skills and expertise. And at the end, I invited them to join me in Course from Scratch in my program, um, which was called something different back then. You know, went through like three different names and all y'all, you should know it is not perfect the first time. It is always something crazy. And mine definitely was. And so I, yeah, so that's how I was kind of forced into launching before I was ready um, through that webinar. Um, yeah. And so that I ended up doing that first launch, which was like a 20 K launch. And, um, and you know, you go through life and you work with people and you help other people be successful. And, you know, but that for me was really like the proof is in the pudding, like, okay, cool. Like you really do know what you're didn't know what you're doing. And we doubt ourselves so much, but that was a great moment for me. Um, and, and when I did that launch, um, I guess, yeah, it definitely, I used, um, what I teach today is the, um, MVC method. So it's, you know, it kind of like if you're, it's the minimum viable course. So it is the ugly rough draft version of your course. So, um, what I show people how to do is to not fall into the trap of creating your course content all before you're ready to launch. Um, that is a really popular narrative when it comes to creating courses. And I saw this over and over at Udemy. I would see brilliant people just get stuck on the course creation piece. Um, and so what I have seen, you know, is that you know, you don't need to be, I call him Nathan. Nathan is a dude who is locked in a cave for like 80 years working on his content, 
you know, perfecting it and creating the perfect course. Um, and he comes out and peeks out every five years and, and you like, are oh, you still working on it, Nathan? He's like, yep, I'm still working on this course and making it perfect. And that's a lot of people. Um, and so what we've done is we've cut that out. And I say, you are going to um, get really clear about who your customer is. So in the program, we walk through the four C's, you know, so first it is who are your customers? Let's get on the phone with them. So like in, you know, in the second week, you're on the phone talking to potential customers, right? And getting really clear about who they are. Um, you know, Meredith is 41. She has three kids, lives with her husband in Atlanta. This is the thing. These are the things that keep her up at night, you know, getting that detailed. And so you talk to your customers um, and you make sure that you are validating the assumptions you have about what they actually need. That helps you one, validate you are actually an expert, but two, get really specific about how you can solve their pain. Um, so that's kind of the first, you know, the first phase. And then after that, the second C is your um, culture ad, uh, what I call your culture ad. So this is your unique set of experiences and assets. Um, it, it comes from, you know, back when I was working at a startup and you're probably familiar with this, Nikayla, but when you're interviewing people, they ask, you know, is this person a culture fit? Right. Um, and what I learned is like, okay, that means, yeah, do they have the same values as me? You know, do they, are they going to, do they work like us? But what I found was that's very limiting because it's, it's really essentially saying, is this person like me? Are they like me? And what I learned is it's so much better to look at, at each other and at, at ourselves as a culture ad. What are you adding? What value are you adding? What new unique voice are you adding? Right. And so this is where all those things we hid as a kid that made us different because we didn't want to be bullied. We didn't want to stand out. Guess what? Those are the things that make you a culture ad and actually make you stand out in a good way in your niche today. So we spend time in the culture ad section, actually uncovering your culture ad and helping you articulate it in a way that resonates with, you know, with your people. Um, and that way people are like, hell yeah. When they see you, they're not like, ah, oh, yeah, she cool. She all right. <laughs> like, that's what we're really going for. Um, yeah. And so in, you know, in that culture ad section, you, um, you create your own, your own voice, your own perspective, and that leads into the content. So when you're in the content phase, notice we are just now getting to the content phase. In the content phase, this is where you create your own unique framework or methodology, right? So I've got my MVC method. There's like this, you know, Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people. You know, there's uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Those are all frameworks. And um, what we teach is you just need one framework, right? Like uh, there are so many people like Jeff Walker with launch. He built an entire empire, you know, seven or eight figure or nine figure. I don't know what he's doing these days. But he's up there on his PLF product launch formula, one formula, one framework. So what we do is show you how to create your unique framework, you know, your unique recipe for success that helps you stand out that ain't nobody else got. Um, and then after you do that, then you move into conversions and you pre-sell your course. Um, and I won't get to the, we can follow up with what exactly that looks like in a second, but just in general, you pre-sell your course and notice you don't have any slides created for your course. You're not locking yourself with video scripts and recording video. Nope. You have no course content. You just know who you're teaching, what the big promise is that you're teaching them, the milestones that you're helping them meet and what your price is. And you get on the phone and you invite people to your program. So that's like the MVC method that we teach. Um, yeah. Inside the program. Why do you think that most people, including me, overthink this process of packaging our expertise into a course and how, you know, does the MVC truly solve for it? Yes. So, I mean, a lot of it, and I don't, I don't, it, it makes sense, right? Because what we see out there are most people saying, these are the steps to creating a course. Now, there's a difference between someone who is, you know, an expert course creator and someone who is a marketer or business person. So when you are a marketer or business person, you are drawing a, drawing a straight line from you to the cash, from you to the customer, right? So you're creating an offer first and, you know, and then creating all the content and the hoopla and all the crazy stuff around it to sell it. And so I think like a lot of people who you see out there are maybe not necessarily thinking like marketers or business people, but they, you know, they're like, they're content creators and they're like, well, um, what I see, and I think we also look at people who are 10 years ahead of us and we see what they do, but we don't know why they're doing that. Or we don't know that in year one of their business, it looked a lot different. Um, and I've been, you know, I was guilty of this too, you know, where I'm like, oh, okay, I need a 
we probably need a blog and we probably need to do these webinars and whatever, um, but not knowing the why, the why behind it. So what I encourage people to do is, is ask yourself the why, you know, why do I really need this website when I only have two people visiting it every month? Shouldn't I focus <laughs> instead on this webinar registration page because I'm driving traffic right. to that, right? Like, so, um, yeah, so I think it is just a lot of like what's out there and that you're not putting your like marketer and, you know, business hat on. With that first launch one, how did you know what you wanted to teach? As you said, you've gone through some iterations and then break it down for us. Like, how did you actually go about going from zero to 20,000? Yeah. So I had a really hard time deciding. So I took about three months to decide on the topic. Um, I was going between, should I teach people how to create and land their dream job? Because I had done that a couple of times. Should I help you just start an online business? Or should I help you create and launch a course? And so um, what I ended up doing is spending three months just kind of thinking through them. Um, and so today, what I've realized is there are like five areas you want to think through if you're undecided. You know, And so a few of them are just, what customer are you most excited to work with? Right. So which type of person are you most excited to work with someone who's, you know, looking for a full time job or someone who's trying to be an entrepreneur? Right. That was a question I asked myself. So who are you most excited to work with? What topic most excites you? Right. So if you're going to be hired to do a keynote or, you know, blog post or whatever on this topic, are you excited about the topic? Um, and then what addresses your why? Right. Like, what do you want to be known for? What do you want uh, to be in the Forbes 40 under 40, 30 and 30, whatever, um, you know, for, right? Like, what do you want to be known for? So there are a few questions that I wasn't paying attention to. And the one that a couple that were deal breakers for me were, okay, your track record, where do you have an established track record? So if you went to like my LinkedIn, my Facebook, anything, um, it was very clear that I was focused on online course creation and launching. So that really helped push me over the edge. Um, and then the second thing is specificity and being in a niche. So the fact, so when I was comparing, okay, I can either help people start their online business or I can help them create and launch a course. I knew that the course was way more niche than the creating a business. And I knew that there were way less people with that specialized expertise. Like ain't nobody got my expertise and my experience, right? Like working at Udemy with all these instructors for three years, like nobody has that level of experience. So I knew going more niche uh, would pay off and I could always go broader. So after I start niche with the course creation, you know, later the next course could be about, okay, now how to create your online business. Um, so yeah, so that's that's, that's how I would recommend, you know, uh, deciding. Um, and yeah. And so I guess once I decided I, so I had no email list, right? So when I did that 20 K launch, I was not, I had no professionally designed website. What you see today is my first professionally designed website ever in the history of, of me. So I had, <laughs> and that just launched exactly. Today. So again, don't, don't look at where I am today. Like this was back in the day. So I had a janky one page website. I had no email list, no social media followers. It was just my friends, and my family on Instagram following me. So what I decided to do is partner with, in, with influencers. Um, so I partnered with influencers and then I did Facebook ads. So those were the two main drivers for the, the 20 K launch. Um, so it was about, I think it was about half and half. So half of my leads came from partnering with people. Um, and then half of my leads came from Facebook ads. And when I partnered with people, um, I made it really simple. So again, don't go be getting all crazy with these partnerships and affiliate stuff. Like you see the big <laughs> guys out there doing that, but that's because they have like 20 people on their team. So as yes. a one woman show, um, you have one funnel. Okay. So mine was a webinar, you know, I call it, you need a content event. So it could be something, some content event. It could be a five day challenge. It could be a a live, you know, Facebook live, but my chosen one was a, a masterclass or a webinar. So I just created one webinar. Um, it was the same, you know, the same webinar I created that. And I would just have influencers invite people to that webinar. And I would just give them credit for any of the people they brought that bought. And that was it. And I would just, I gave them a few emails to send, uh, you know, promoted on social media. Um, and that was pretty much it. So that's that. And then the Facebook ads, um, that I ran and luckily I, with that, even with that first campaign, I was already getting returns. Um, I didn't know this is my first time running ads and 
I had no idea that most people who run ads, it takes a second to optimize it. Like, you know, for that first month, you kind of anticipate, all right, I'm gonna lose money. You know, if we break even, we're gonna be lucky. We'll have to make money later. Um, but yeah, with that first campaign, I think it was like a one to three return. So for every dollar we spent, we made $3 um, immediately. And then with payment plans, you know, it went up from there. Um, so yeah, so that was essentially like how I made that first launch happen. And I built my list from zero to 1500 email subscribers over 60 days um, using mainly those those tactics. Hey guys, it's Nikayla here with a quick word from our sponsors. If you have a business or you know someone who does, you probably know by now that small business owners, we wear a lot of hats. And some of those hats are mad fun, I'm not gonna lie. But some of them like filing taxes and running payroll, they're not so great. That's where Gusto comes in. Gusto makes payroll, taxes, and HR actually easy for us small businesses. It's fast with simple payroll processing benefits and expert HR support all in one place. Gusto automatically pays and files your federal, state, and local taxes, so you don't have to worry about all that. Plus, they make it easy to add on things like health benefits and even 401ks for your team. So those old school clunky payroll providers that you probably thought you had to look at, they just weren't built for the way we work as modern small businesses, but Gusto is. So let them wear all of those hats for you. You have better things to do. Side Hustle Pro listeners, you get three months free when you run your first payroll. So test it out. See for yourself at gusto.com slash SHP. That's gusto.com slash SHP. So the number one question I get about side hustling is how do I get started? And the other day, I decided to kind of take inventory of what I was doing in my early days of side hustling. How did I get started with Side Hustle Pro? And the biggest thing that stood out to me is that I was always investing in skill and personal development, meaning, and I like to do just in time learning. So when I was ready to do something new or try something else, I would invest in a class to learn that skill and then practice implementing it. So the rest of my development and learning came from my actual experience. So I highly recommend you do the same. What is it that you want to do? Do you want to finally put up your website? Then head over to Skillshare and take a class on putting up your website. Do you want to get started with social media and you're not sure how to start? Head over to Skillshare and start taking some classes. Skillshare is so great because it's an online learning community. It has over 25,000 classes in anything you can think of from photography to entrepreneurship, even podcasting. And right now they are offering a special offer just for Side Hustle Pro listeners. You can get two months of unlimited access to Skillshare for free. Imagine what you can do in two months, how many classes you can take. But remember to do the implementation piece, all right? So head over to Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. That's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro to get started with your two free months. And one more time, that's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. Another thing that I noticed is you are laser focused on having one asset. Now, a lot of people come to me and they're like, I have so many great ideas. I can't focus. I have to do them all. And at the same time, there is some merit, right, to having multiple income streams. That is something that is emphasized by a lot of the guests on my show. But can you talk about why you are a proponent of this one asset model and why you, you're kind of redefining what it means to be an entrepreneur with this whole online course business? Absolutely. So you know, multiple income streams. Yeah, totally. I think the problem with that is most people who pursue the multiple income streams don't even master the first one. So I think, Ooh, say that again. <laughs> I'm calling people out. Um, yeah, no, I think like the problem I see with people who pursue these multiple income streams is you don't take the time to master the first one. So that becomes really crippling because now you got all these like haphazard, multi, you know, quote unquote, oh yeah, I got multiple income streams, but each of those streams are making you like $50 a month. Like, what are we doing? So my, yeah, my advice is really to focus on uh, one, right? And once you master that, guess what? You can splinter that into other streams way more easily. And you now have like a head start. Um, so yeah, so I think like for me, I, and I, listen, I completely 
was that person. I had in, you know, there've been like a three month period, I started five different blogs. I had three different, you know, little YouTube shows I started. Like I used to be that person. I thought I had to create all this. You had a podcast, right? right. I had a (laughs) podcast. We had Brand New Nation. Okay. Like all kinds of things. And, um, and things, you know, even, yeah, in this, in this career, you know, I tried to like reinvent the wheel and create a whole new course when course from scratch hadn't even gotten its legs yet. Like, what are you really doing? So I, I finally, you know, what I did is I actually worked with the coaches to help me level up. So one thing I've seen in my progress, um, this like crazy growth that I've seen over the last few months is definitely attributed to one, hiring these coaches um, who helped me with my offer, just refine my offer and my funnel. And then two, I did Landmark, um, which is, you know, a program, like a self-development program. I did that. Um, that really taught me about myself and about the habits I needed and the integrity and all of that. Um, between those two things, that like those two things have really made a huge difference. So for me, the the commonality is usually like coaching, like seeking somebody who is, you know, five steps, 10 steps ahead of me um, and getting, giving them either my time or my money, whichever I have more of, um, you know, to, to help me. And yeah. And so today my business looks a lot different from when I, you know, when I first started, I mean, today I have one webinar, I have one course and I have one main marketing mechanism. Um, and so, yeah, so what I do is I have my webinar, which my, the one I typically do is my Insta course sales webinar. So it just talks about how my online course made $25,000 in one month from Instagram alone. Um, so I walk you through that process. So what I'll do is at the top of the funnel, I will run ads. Um, and like, I'm so I've talked to a few different Facebook ads experts now, like these are people who, you know, been running ads for a long time, manage like a million dollars a month. And they're like, where in tarnation did you think, think it was like a good idea to like put all these random targeting groups together? So apparently like, <laughs> this is crazy stuff. but they're like, it is working though. So don't touch it. Just leave your crazy things and let it, let it do its thing. So, so that works really well and it's allowed me to scale. Right. So, so I started out spending, let's say like uh, $200 every week, right? It's $200 every week. Um, so you'd see my ad either on Facebook or on Instagram, you would come on my webinar and then on my webinar, I would, you know, give you my process and invite you to join me in course from scratch. And then I'd send a few emails afterwards and that would be it. So it's a very like straightforward process. And every week I rinse and repeat. So it's the same webinar, the same emails. And I have my VA reschedule the emails for me. She updates my webinar page. So all I do is show up. And if there are any, you know, last minute sales questions that come in, I can answer them over email. Um, but that's pretty much it. And and it's it's I'm I'm glad to have found a a marketing channel that is scalable. Um, so you know, I've got Instagram is like my like constant organic channel by just getting followers there and, and having them register for my webinar. But then I've got you know Facebook ads, which is converting really well, and that's something I could just pull the lever up, you know, if I want to. Now. Quick question about these coaches. Where did you find and, you know, how did you know how to vet a coach that was really going to help you specifically in in what you were trying to do? And, you know, the same thing with this Landmark program. Yeah. So usually, so with Landmark, it came from a, uh, it came from my friend Tara Reed, uh, founder of Apps Without Code. And so she recommended Landmark. And so she, you know, she's killing it in her business. So anything she recommends, I'm like, okay, yes without asking questions. So that's why I did Landmark. And then with the coaches, I was actually on both of their email lists. And um, and so I've been watching them over the years. I already knew that they were legitimate. Um, you know, I've talked to a couple people in my network just to confirm. Um, but yeah, but usually like one thing I... I confirm before working with someone is how much revenue they're generating in their business. And secondly, how fast they're growing their business. Cause it's one thing if you're doing a million a year in your business, but you've been doing that for the last seven years and there's been no growth. Or if you're doing mm-hmm. half a million, but it took you, you know, five years to get there. Um, I'm all about like accelerated progress. So that's one thing I looked for. And I knew that these guys, you know, had just started like a new initiative and had already gotten it up to, you know, seven figures in a short period of time. And so they're the kind of guys um, that, yeah, I wanted to like align myself with and, and learn from. So yeah, so those are a couple of the like checks that I do. 
Okay. And speaking of revenue, um, you know, you are really good at sharing the wealth, sharing the knowledge of everything you learn along the way. So I know that you are on the road to that one million, um, that first one million, and in a rapid pace. <laughs> can we talk? Can we break this down? How are you positioning yourself for that? Are you doing a webinar weekly? Like, how are you thinking about the actual money milestones? Absolutely. So um, one thing we talk a lot about in Course from Scratch is launch math, right? Like when you launch something or in your business, when you're making money, it is not personal, it's math. So when I started out the year, I had my little spreadsheet and it's, you know, 2018 hashtag goals. That's the spreadsheet. And I laid out every month how much, like I essentially said, okay, I want to reach a million by December. And then I broke out what that looked like. And so I come from, so the, the good and the bad news. So is that I, you know, I come from a startup background. I learned a ton when I was at Udemy, you know, working under an amazing growth marketer, um, Archie and under Dinesh. And that's why I'm all in these numbers, looking at the marketing and the growth. But the startup model is usually let's grow 20% month over month, right? Because they're a bigger organization. There's reasons for that. So what I did is on my spreadsheet, I mapped out the numbers and I started with, uh, so December I did um, 27K. Yeah, I did 27K in my business in December. So what I did is I just increased 20% month over month from 27K. I, I, I said, okay, January, let's say we make 27K. Now let's grow 20% month over month. And so by doing that, that got me to a million in December. So that's just an easy way to like do it. And what I did is I knew my Facebook ad spend and how it related to how much money I was making. So I knew that, you know, okay, I'm getting between three to five returns. So if I spend this much, I should be able to make this much. So I estimated it. So on my sheet, I just have, this is how much you need to spend on Facebook ads. This is how many leads it's going to get you. And I know my whole funnel. I know how much I convert on webinars, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's how I like planned it. Now, what I didn't think about was, oh, like you don't have to steadily grow 20% month over month if you have a marketing uh, a lever that's working for you. So, you know, I recently decided to relaunch my course because I made some amazing updates. People are getting, including you, are like benefiting from it, getting like amazing results, killing it. So I thought, yes. well, let me just celebrate this and like announce it to the world. Um, so I did a launch and so I ended up doing it. We just finished actually like two days ago. So this is amazing. But yeah, we ended up doing 167K for the total launch. And just so people know, get out of town. <laughs> Please pause. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Continue. Carry on. <laughs> you are so funny. Um, yeah. So, um, and yeah, and so 167K. Now, when we talk about launch numbers, just so y'all know. Whenever you see those launch numbers, that is the total of like how much cash you collected right now, plus what you're going to collect in the future from payment plans, right? But of course, you're going to have some people like not pay, right? So, so any just so y'all know, that's like the big like fancy number. Um, and so what that looks like is uh, eighty two thousand dollars in cash. So I actually made you know eighty two thousand dollars like in the bank right now, and then I'll get the rest of it over yeah the next six months, right? So, um, so that that was possible because of, um, of yeah, the, the Facebook funnel, like the webinar. And when I say launch again, we make things so complicated. And I talk to so many people who are like, Oh, I'm doing this course launch. It's got all these things. My launch literally consisted of two webinar sequences. That was it. I did a webinar on January 31st. I did another one on February 7th. And I just sent the emails before and after the webinar. Um, maybe I did a few, I did a few Instagram stories but not, not as many as I should have. Um, but that was it. Like literally my launch, there were no affiliates. There was no parade in the streets. There was no flying to Tokyo, doing nothing crazy. It was like two webinar sequences. That's it. Did 167K. And so what I've learned is, yeah, I will at this pace get to a million way faster than I thought because I don't have to do the slow 20% month over month growth. Um, but yeah, but that's kind of how you like think, I think through the numbers. You know, congratulations to you. I think it is more than proving the fact that you're helping people, you're providing value and, you know, people are able to share that value immediately because this is a program that teaches you to, you know, cut out the fluff and like start making money immediately. And then, you know, that just continues to snowball from there. Is there anyone who this program is not for? Mm. So, okay, so I definitely target 
people. So, you know, there are two different mindsets. There's the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. So, you know, the people who have the fixed mindset who are like not open to learning new things, they tend to blame others when things aren't going well. They're not problem solvers. Um, definitely not for them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's not for you if you want to create a low priced, uh, digital product. So if you, you know, if you're out here trying to do the $19, um, product or a $47 product, $97 product, um, the strategies we teach show you how to create a premium program. So something that's $500 or more, mm-hmm. right. And it's okay. Like lower price products, totally fine. Um, this prod, this, uh, course from scratch program though, is definitely suited for you for a premium program. And I will say there is this assumption that if you've never created products, you need to start with a low product. And that is not absolutely not true. My very first product was $2,000, right? And that's, I knew my stuff. I got people results. So you put yourself out there as a premium brand and people will respect that. So yeah, so just put that out there, go premium y'all. Um, and who else? Yeah, but no, I would say all genres, all categories, like I told you, I mean, there are all kinds of categories where you can create a premium course and be successful. You know, something we didn't really touch on as much is what went wrong during this journey? Mm, Yeah, a couple of things. So the first thing would be the lack of focus. So thinking that I needed to reinvent the wheel and thinking that it was supposed to be hard. That's a big thing I still face. When something feels too easy, I just, as an entrepreneur, like we're, we're used to the struggle. We're used to the, we got to grind it out. And when it's too easy or we get a little nervous, we're like, wait, wait, hold up. No, I need to be doing something else. So I would have those moments where I created work for myself because I thought I was supposed to. The second thing I'm still working on this right now is seeing myself. And I learned this, um, went to this mastermind retreat over the weekend And one of the gentlemen, Clifton Honoré, who's an amazing artist, um, he was like, you need to see yourself as the talent and you need to hire a producer to run your show for you. So you just show up. And I didn't realize that all this time I've been, I've been a solo founder and occasionally, you know, I would hire a contractor to help me with this, help me with that. And so currently I was looking to hire, okay, a virtual assistant, maybe a content person. And I didn't realize I need a layer in between me and, you know, that team to be my ace, my right-hand person. Otherwise I'm still going to be going crazy managing all these multiple people. Um, so that was one, that's what a, a recent major learning for me as like, after I reached a certain point, I need to let go and I need to not try to do everything and like find like that ace to be that person. Now, a lot of times when I say the word entrepreneurship, people immediately think I'm talking about some tech startup. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and sometimes I struggle with that even with, within my guests. I'm like, well, this is not a show about tech. It's not a show about Silicon Valley. Like this is a show about all of the dope people that I see out there who are reinventing business. I say all this to say both are important. You know, I can't imagine a world without the awesome tech startups that have come out in the last decades, but you are redefining what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I want more and more people to understand that there are millionaires, billionaires out there killing it. And they're just making money online. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And here's the big difference, right? The, um, a lot of the, these people you talk about who are, you know, the millionaires, billionaires, it's because they're actually dedicated to their customer and solving a specific pain point for their customer versus a lot of the founders. Cause I used to be one of these people, by the way, when I started my first startup, why did I start? What was I pursuing? I was pursuing the glamour. I was pursuing the exit of the company. I wasn't out here like focused on helping customers solve their problems. So fundamentally the, you know, the, the end result of those two types of companies are going to be completely different because one is actually trying to solve a pain point of a customer. And guess what? When you solve a pain point of the customer, well, you get customers to pay you money and you just, you go find more and more of them. So I do wish, you know, that I guess, and this just, I mean, goes to people being in touch with their why and what's important to them. But I mean, I personally appreciate businesses that solve problems and like startups and companies that solve real problems for people. Um, yeah. And that make their lives better. So I think if the focus was there instead of on the glamour and the exit, things will look a lot different. 
Amen. Yes. And again, that's not to knock anyone's business, y'all, yeah. before you come sending me some weird <laughs> Don't emails. Don't come for her, y'all. Don't come for her. I just want to expose you to all the people out there making money and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and, and, and a difference. Like the, and yeah. making a difference. <laughs> I think more of us need to understand that value can come from all different walks of life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the the revenue you're making, if you're in this and, you know, and you're creating really valuable, uh, really good content, right? Like in, in great courses and programs and supporting people through implementation and coaching, like the revenue you're making is a direct reflection of the lives you're changing. And I think more of us should tap into our power too, which is why I love packaging your expertise, right? It's like literally you take for granted what you know. Yes. Impacting others' lives is a whole new layer of life and business that I'm uncovering and getting used to because, you know, it scared me at first. It made me nervous to think of others depending on me or letting people down. And but you're going to have to push through that to get to what could ultimately be life changing for you and them. Absolutely. So, you know, we could talk forever. I'm going to have to cut it here (laughs) and we're going to transition to the lightning round. And you're basically just going to answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. All righty. So number one, what's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Mm. So, okay. So one would be the book Launch by Jeff Walker and then Ask by Ryan Levesque. Um, I think every, you know, online digital business person should have read those. And honestly, looking at other people's income reports. So other internet marketers online who publish their income reports, um, that helps me a ton. That is so funny. You know, I love income reports, but I would never do one. Is that bad? <laughs> I, I know I should interrupt lightning round, right. but that scares me. Like where I'm from, that's how you get robbed. Oh, that's like, so funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you get robbed. Please. But yeah, I mean, you're right. You're right, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, number number two. What's been the best business book or podcast episode that you've consumed this year? Ooh, this year. So, okay. So every year I reread or re- I read, y'all, I mean, listen to, because I'm on Audible. I don't really read, I listen. Um, but I, uh, it's Essentialism. So yeah, Essentialism by Greg McCone. That stays you, that will keep you super focused. So if you're having a hard time balancing all these things, blah, blah, uh, read Essentialism. And another one I would say is The Power of Habit. And um, I have to thank my friend Thomas K.R. Stovall for recommending this, but The Power of Habit. Oh, in terms of, sorry, mistakes that I made is I did not establish a healthy routine of habits. So there, that's why it, my, my success had been black and white. When I didn't have the habits, I wasn't exercising regularly, wasn't eating, wasn't drinking enough water, all that. My success was like, bloop, wah, wah. but as soon as I had those habits, those daily habits, I saw a huge difference. So the power of habit. Number three, which black woman entrepreneur inspires you and why? Ooh. Um, so I would say right now, the first person who comes to mind is Morgan DeBond, founder of Blavity. Um, and I'm lucky to have her as a friend as well. And I think that's a part of it is because we see a lot of people online, right? On Instagram, flexing, stunting. And then later you learn like, oh, okay, like things aren't exactly, the numbers aren't there or whatever. Like they they just flex in. But the fact that I know her, I guess I know that she's built this amazing company that has so much value, is doing it for the culture, like, and she's super chill and amazing leader. Um, yeah, I learn a lot from her just being around her. Number four, what's a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Yes. Uh, drinking water. Like that is the key. I mean, whenever I start yawning, you know, before I would reach for like a carb, you know, a piece of bread or something, I'd be like, oh, I'm yawning. Let me just, but uh, drink a tall glass of cold water and you in that. So yeah, definitely drinking water. Good for energy. Number five, what's your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? Hmm. So one thing I would share is I hear about people losing their jobs so often that I'm, I've come to learn that the best insurance for me has been starting my own business. Um, so like, yeah. Uh, and I would say the sooner you can learn what your culture ad is. So whatever your unique expertise is, learn how to articulate that in a way that resonates with your customers and package that into an offer um, the sooner you will find success. 
and don't get caught up in the tech. So ask yourself, how can I solve a customer's problem with no tech? Right. And that might be consulting. Consulting is a very great way to ease into an online business. You don't need a website. You don't need fancy webinar, email service provider. You don't need any of that. You just need you and your knowledge and to connect with the right customer over LinkedIn, sending them a LinkedIn message. All right. Get get dirty. Get out here. Message people, you know, talk to them, whatever. Um, that's what I would say. Like the faster you can do that, the more insurance uh, for your revenue, for your income, for your livelihood you'll have. All right. So what's the best way that we can connect with you after this episode? Yes. Um, so you can find me at daniellelesley.com. And uh, I'm Danielle Leslie across all platforms. I'm most active on Instagram. So you can find me at Danielle Leslie there. All right, cool. Well, Danielle, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you in the guest chair. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Nikayla. Hey, hey, thanks for listening. Now stay connected in between episodes by texting Side Hustle Pro to 44222. You'll get my weekly Six Bullet Saturday newsletters where I share what I'm up to, what I'm reading, my business tip of the week, and resources to help you grow your side hustle. And I'm working behind the scenes on some live events, which my email list will get access to first. So make sure you're in the loop. Text Side Hustle Pro to 44222 or visit sidehustlepro.co slash SBS.